Hello everyone, happy Saturday morning. Thanks for making it, hopefully you're not too hungover and everyone's bright and awake. Thanks for coming to my talk, how rocket science can help build your app. And boy, that seems a little strange. Um, rocket science is a very abused term. I'm not even a huge fan of it, but it got you guys here, so that's great. So who am I? Uh, so I'm a f I wear a few different hats. Uh, I am a NASA JPL mission architect. I typically live in the part of JPL where we come up with missions at the very beginning. I've worked on several dozen concepts, a few of my own. Though right now I'm taking a break to finish my PhD down the road at WashU in high energy uh, physics. Some people know me as a love expert. Uh, a little bit strange, uh, but they say those who can't do teach and that's what my girlfriend thinks as well. But I started a company, Nanaya, around an algorithm that can actually predict your love life. And we'll get to that a little bit later. And the thread that unites all of these is that, you know, if I had to call myself anything, it's more of a systems theorist. So is it a sociological system, an economic system, mechanical, physical, uh, computer, whatever? I like thinking about how complex things work. Now, a few brief caveats uh, before I begin. Uh, all the views expressed here today are mine, they are opinions, they very well may be completely wrong, uh, but most importantly, they do not reflect NASA or Caltech JPL. I'm here on behalf of NIA. What you'll end up also seeing is a lot of text on slides, which is there for context. You can listen to the words instead of being confused over some of the things that I write. And again, this is Saturday morning, and it is a management theory talk. So. Uh, Buckle up, we're in for a wild ride. Okay, so how to begin? Let's think about two different organizations. They have two different purposes, two different goals, customers, stakeholders, uh, revenue streams. One is Google and one is JPL. So what are like some of the differences that immediately come to mind? Uh, the first one for me is adversity to risk. Uh, we can think of Google, and I'm not necessarily a huge fan uh, of Google, but really their products. Uh, and we have things like Google Plus, Google Glasses, uh, that have been like programmatic failures, meaning that the budgets, the schedules couldn't close with respect to the development cycle. Or, and then you have uh, operational failures like Google Plus, which you build it, it's deployed, and then it just doesn't really work out within that market. But it doesn't really matter to Google because, hey, what other alternatives are out there? So long as you are in the market, you've established yourself there, and that is their purpose. So adversity to the risk is uh, pretty not high on the priority of Google's agenda. On the other hand, you have NASA or Caltech JPL, and if you, if you lose a $500 million, $2 billion mission, you have to go back to Congress and ask for that money, and they will probably not give it to you. And what we have is Mars Polar Lander, which uh, had a deployment failure of its legs before it landed uh, near the North Pole of Mars. Um, the legs unfurled about uh, tens of meters above the surface. The accelerometer said, oh, we landed, and it cut the entry engine, so then it hit the surface and everything broke, and that was that. Uh, and we were able to do it after a decade or so through a different cycle of uh, missions. But another thing that comes is from the history of the organizations, and that is ideology. Uh, if you think of Silicon Valley, the 1970s, the concept of individuality, uh, personal freedom, that we can have these natural self-organizing systems, uh, these will be ultimately what's most efficient, uh, or so that ideology says. But on the other hand, you have NASA, which if you think about it, you go back to World War II, the Cold War, you have uh, these systems, these human systems that are designed to fight in conflict, to prepare for conflict, and they are highly critical. And because of that, you have hierarchies. And that's what NASA has inherited. Uh, and the last one that I can think of that, that's superficial but still deep in a sense is the system's complexity. If you're making a Google product, and it's a, it's a Google project for the next set of software, you have interfaces within the project, and then you also have to interfaces beyond the project. And these are software interfaces, but also user experience interfaces, so you can maintain uniformity across Google, Google products. But if you think of spacecraft that uh, NASA builds, uh, they are entities uh, complete onto themselves. You have multiple different subsystems. You have the telecommunications, thermal management, uh, science instruments. They, own, they have their own hardware, they have their own software, and they all have to interface. And the variability of this uh, high dimensionality leads to significantly more complexity for any one product. So 
how does NASA do things, and how can that be applied to software development? And that's what I'm here to talk about. Uh, I, myself, um, started Anaya, this sort of software app company, and I applied what I would say are relatively controversial methods, as you'll be seeing, to building software. And they worked very well, but the ultimate thesis of this talk is that there is no silver bullet for how to develop in, uh, your project. So how does NASA do things? Um, so you can see here there are many phases. You have this pre-phase A, a phase A, phase B, phase C, phase D, E, and uh, F, right, F. And you'll see all these different triangles. And what those triangles are are these very large reviews where you get together people on the team, uh, external experts, and you sit together for a day or even up to a week to go over everything that you have done and to make sure that everything is good. And if the reviewers, which are not necessarily on your team, say you haven't done a good job, you have homework to do, everything stops until it's complete, this, the reviewers are satisfied, and then you can continue. But let's go into a little bit more detail. So for the Agile folks out there, uh, you would be familiar with the Scrum. And that's sort of what we do in this uh, pre-phase A, which is we think of the problem, the mission goal, for a space mission. And just think of like, how does this even make sense? Right after that, we think of, uh, does the answer that we came up with in pre-phase A actually make sense? Uh, and that's in phase A. Phase B is the next step of, now that we understand what the mission will look like, how will the project really look like? Uh, in addition to some of the other technical, open technical questions. Uh, phase C and D is really when you start building things, and I mix them together because the truth is, uh, as NASA's found out, as, and as I'm sure you guys all do, is you're building, you test. And the last step for people in ops, it's gulp, because you finally deploy it and you hope that everything works. Well, if you saw that, it looks a little scary maybe because it looks like a waterfall. And, you know, it's, I would say that things are all about words, and people use terms like agile or waterfall, and as far as I'm concerned, they're sort of buzzwords. And the truth is, of course, that there is sort of an agile working group, and they have a concept for how agile design works, how the program works. Now, no implementation is perfect. These are sort of like platonic ideals in a sense. You're never gonna have a true, pure implementation of it. Every project is different. Now, for sort of explaining how NASA goes through these different phases, I'll use the example of a Uranus probe. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Uh, no one laughs about it at work. Uh, <laughs> and I just kind of feel awkward for laughing inside. Um, and, and this is a fictional example, but I have worked on two different concepts of this mission. And the general idea is you send a spacecraft out there that deploys a probe. And the probe enters Uranus, and it tries to take measurements of the upper atmosphere to understand, well, how is it composed, what is the structure, the temperature, the density, the composition of clouds, and whatnot. So pre-phase A, we're, we're thinking about this probe. You start off with, like, what are the actual key objectives? What do you want to accomplish? And that's sort of characterized by what I had up in the last slide, uh, characterize the upper atmosphere. Then come, what comes next is the high-level requirements. So what do you need for the project to succeed, which is building the thing and deploying the thing and operating the thing, and then also the mission itself. So uh, to get like actual mission success that you get the right science back. And then when you have all these different requirements, we all know there's more than one way to come up with a solution or a correct solution. But I would argue there it tends to be a best solution. And what we do is we have these trade studies where we look at this wide parameter space of potential solutions to figure out what is what we think is best. So, you know, there's a lot of words up there, but I'm just gonna speak very generally to them. This is for, like, the details. Uh, so we come up with these requirements that the probe must do these certain things to make sure that we get the correct science back. Uh, we must get the data back to Earth, because otherwise, why did he send anything out there? And there's a programmatic requirement. Uh, we need to launch this thing by 2021, otherwise we miss our launch window to Uranus, and we'll have to wait over a decade for the next opportunity. And what we start to do is we build what's called a science traceability matrix. And I don't have a laser pointer, so I'm just gonna run. So we have high-level science goals. So here is we wanna figure out the noble gas abundances. Uh, so your argon, helium, and we have to do a specific measurement with respect to what we want from uh, these uh, noble gases. 
And to do that, we'll need an instrument, which is a mass spectrometer. And then the functional requirement is the probe needs to reach this steep within the atmosphere to be able to do so. So what we've done is we've connected the requirements to the purpose of why we're doing this whole thing. Trade studies. So, okay, well, there is more than one way to do it. So we can do an orbiter mission or a flyby, which is the parent spacecraft which communicates to the probe, because once you start sending something into the atmosphere of Uranus, good luck trying to close a radio link. So we can either have it orbit and circle around the planet, which means you have to carry a lot more propulsion, or you're just going to end up flying by it, and that's probably cheaper, but maybe you'll lose some of the radio uh, link with the probe. So there's trade-offs, and there's a few different ones. Uh, and when we have all these different trades, uh, some of them are independent, some of them are dependent, and you get this sort of a funny-looking chart. Um, it's kind of hard to read the title, but it's relative science value versus cost with risk indicator. And you have funny different colors, and so each of these boxes represents a different way to do the mission. And we can see that some are more expensive, and we can see there's sort of like a, a deflection point, and we would say that maybe that is the maximum in this, the optimal in this case. Uh, so it depends on the metrics of the mission, but it would be things like uh, parts failure or the chances of establishing a link. Um, cost is an, actually a programmatic risk as well, so if you can't close on a specific cost. So it really does vary, but for a lot of it is um, looking at things that can fail and the probabilities of failure based on past experience and then some uh, modeling. So in pre-phase A, oh sorry, so how can this be effective? Because you're starting to plan a lot of really complicated things when like, you don't really have anything. I mean, we're not there. We don't actually know a lot of the details about Uranus because, and that's another one of the risks, we don't know much about the upper atmosphere because only one mission has actually gone there, which is Voyager 2. So you get everyone that's sort of an expert that has some experience into the same room. Uh, so people from the project managers, the scientists, uh, to people on the telecom side, thermal management, power systems, and you just think of all of the different ways to do it in a very sort of like open, brainstormy way, and you come up with how this trade space is populated, people go and do their homework, and then they fill out charts like the one you saw on the last slide. So at the end of phase A, you think you have sort of a way that this might make sense, and you have it reviewed, and it's the mission concept review, and you got a few dozen people in the room, and that's where NASA says, okay, we think we're gonna spend $500 million on this, or two billion or whatever. Next is, okay, well, does the thing that we think makes sense actually make sense? Because you haven't thought it out too, too much yet. So you have to identify the critical systems and then the team, without which the mission will not happen. Next is, okay, well, if you now know these critical systems, you can know a little bit more, have a little bit more granularity of the requirements that flow from them. And when you have those requirements, you can begin to further define the mission, uh, like the technical aspect, and then the project aspect as well, where you can put together sort of a labor schedule, a budget, and that'll give you an idea of how things will end up really working out in detail. So for the critical systems, the Uranus probe will have the th probe's thermal protection system because it gets pretty hot when you start descending at you know, many kilometers a second into an atmosphere. Uh, the probe instruments that give you the science. Here I'm gonna say that we couldn't find a way to make it close within the budget unless we used an old radio. Uh, so that's a critical system because we can't fulfill the budget otherwise. And then also the system's engineering complexity. Well, that's not a system, but you know what? It's really important that we make sure that everything else is as simple as possible if it's not critical. And everyone who is a technical engineer needs to be informed of that. From that, we get more requirements. So, for instance, from the radio requirement, we have to see that, well, this is old hardware, and we build, we're building most other things new. Uh, for various reasons, maybe parts availability. So we have to make sure that those interfaces are well defined and as soon as they're connected, they know how to talk to one another. Uh, and then say another thing that we're getting is a free donated instrument from the French space agency CNES, which is an ethylometer. It measures the density of clouds. And this must be delivered by such and such date so we can integrate it technically. Now, because of arms regulation, everything going to space, even if it's civilian, is technically under arms that's how the US government defines it. So we have to get our lawyers in the room, figure out how, what we have to do for that. That's a programmatic requirement. So from that, we can put together a Gantt chart, figure out what's on the critical path. Things not on the critical path, we can consider descoping and having requirements for descopes. 
we can get a WBS, we can figure out what the labor is, and put together a pretty accurate budget how everything will burn down. Okay, you have more reviews. And then when everyone is happy, you continue. Phase B, so let's, can we actually make this happen? How is it gonna work out? So we start designing things. Uh, we then check for heritage, so that would be like the radio in this example. We check for critical technologies. So say for instance, that nephilometer that the French are uh, making, it's like a new instrument altogether, it's using a new technology. We have to make sure that all the technology is mature, tested, and ready within like a laboratory and flight-like setting before we are ready to even consider putting this on the mission. And if it's not, we have to cut it. And then we move on. And the, one of the biggest reviews is this preliminary design review. So that happens before you start like cutting stuff up in the shop or writing code. And this could be like a week-long ordeal. Phase CD. So this is, you know, building things and making sure they work. So there's like two mantras at JPL, and, and one of them is, and in every review, you really have to say that you're improving, you're doing this, which is test as you build, build as you test. So as you're building things, you're testing them at a component level, and then you integrate to the uh, subsystem level, and then you test again with everything there and all the ways you tested it before, in new ways as well, and then you integrate at the system level, and for, so on and so on, and you're continually testing as you go. And how does this end up looking organizationally? And so when you have big missions, like the $2 billion Mars Science Laboratory, that, uh, uh, Curiosity, that was uh, employing several thousand people at JPL simultaneously. It's a lot of people, and it's a big organization. Uh, so this is obviously a, a simplification. You have the management up at the top. You have the project scientist, project systems engineer, and the project manager, all with the different responsibilities I'll be going over in the Denia example. Below them are teams of systems engineers that make sure that all the specific technical groups, the radios, the thermal control, the power systems, they're all, all the things that they're doing, they're using uniform language, that the system model that they are working off of is the same, the interfaces are uniformly understood as progress continues. And then you have the, the specific technical leads on all the different subsystem or component teams. And then when you start to actually finish some of the subsystems and components, the teams merge and they begin testing together. And it was the job of the systems engineers above them to work with them beforehand to get a systems test and integration uh, plan uh, for when they continue until eventually you have the complete flight system. And then the next step is, well, when you have the flight system together, you test as you fly and then you fly as you test meaning that all the systems tests that you do are exactly what's gonna be happening in the operational environment of the spacecraft, and including the off-nominal conditions, like what happens if this thrust uh, correction maneuver fails, and things like that. And then, because you've tested that way, when you come up with your operations plan, it should be written based on how you did your testing plan. So a big part of even doing the test plan is to plan operations well, well in advance. So in, in phase A, you know, where I do a lot of my work, I'm writing like minute by minute things of how we're taking pictures when we're around a comet. So again, a lot of words up here, but I'm gonna draw just a quick attention to the launch vehicle integration and launch environment. So when we think of a space mission, well, boy, it's in space and it does spacey things. But it has to live on the ground and it has to be on a launch vehicle before that even happens, which means you have to test putting it on a rocket even before you have a rocket. You have to have all that hardware in place. You have to know how you're gonna be managing the spacecraft computer and radio because they'll have to be off. And you have to make sure that everything there will work. And then again, you are gonna be making uh, off nominal tests to figure out how the system behaves and how the various components behave in different environments that you will not be happening as planned. And from there, you do contingency planning and further testing. And you just keep doing that until you run out of time or money. And, I mean, Phase CD has a lot of reviews pretty much at every integration. And you get everyone, all the different technical leads in a room with management, with the systems engineers, and everything is very deeply scrutinized. Phase E is gulp and you launch. But even when you launch, you're actually still testing all the things you're gonna be doing in flight. You don't stop. People are still testing code and testing uh, spacecraft maneuvers. Critical takeaways. So I would argue that yes, you actually can plan every step. And even if you can't plan it exactly, you can at least plan how you will plan it. 
Uh, and a part of doing that is writing the technical and programmatic requirements. So again, not just on the technical things, but of how the entire team will work together, making sure that there is a consistent set of goals and language that everyone's using. Justify requirements. Uh, so make sure there's a reason that they're there, which means everyone's going to be looking at them who's a technical lead, maybe as so long as they're sharing an interface. And then also uh, having a way to make sure that what you're building can even be tested. So I've seen one system in specific, they came up with requirements, but they didn't have a good way of testing it, and then it didn't pass reviews. And, and actually, because of that, the system was sent back into development. Um, and from all these requirements and vetting them, you can get labor, schedule, and budget. And they actually end up being very accurate, uh, I would say. But what's really important is you need a formal system of communication such that everyone is using the same language when they're working together. Time to bring things a little bit down to earth. So in 2014, uh, as a result of a breakup, I came up with an algorithm that can predict your love life. It was her idea, not mine. I have some philosophical opposition to it, but hey, you know what? It's, I, I think it's very helpful for some people. It's actually really cool results. I suggest all of you guys to use it. Um, so people come in. So just to give you an idea of Nanaya, people come in, you do sort of a questionnaire, and you hit submit, and it runs the algorithm, and then you get a six-page report. And I'm, so it's not like online dating. It's actually doing a lot of like calculations in the back. And those calculations, if you're really curious, they're overviewed in this archive paper I wrote with the very clickbait title, should I break up with my girlfriend? Will I find another? Um, and you know what? Uh, media covered it because it's a very nice title. Uh, so, uh, so again, it's, it's, the algorithm it has a lot of math in it. But the interesting thing is with every new user that comes, the data goes into the database. So when the next user comes and you're saying, oh, I'm trying to look for uh, women in St. Louis, it starts polling the women around St. Louis to figure out what is the distribution of values, personality that would match what you're looking for. So every new person that comes improves the fidelity of the model. So again, this is, in my mind, this isn't a software project, this is a space mission. So I have a mission. Provide an easy to use online service offering algorithmically generated personalized predictions for a user's romantic and social life. Uh, so for people who've done like some MBA-ish classes, people will say, oh, the mission goal or statement is very important. And uh, I truly believe it actually is, even if nothing else in that MBA program would be. Now, so the important part of this is it's, it's somewhat specific kind of like characterize the upper atmosphere of Uranus, but there's a lot of ways to do it. So, you know, well, how are we going to do this? So we have a pre-phase A, and, you know, there's project constraints like a NASA, you know, project. Uh, I have, you know, no data, and this is essentially a big data product, no users, uh, no sort of like publicity or marketing. Uh, that's not my wheelhouse. Uh, I have a small team of friends, and I'd have a little bit of money. And the thing that makes this more like a space mission in my mind is this is my money. I'm currently a grad student. This is mission critical. I, I, I need this to work. <laughs> so I am going to be planning the hell out of this. So again, a lot of words. But I sort of think of the very high level, like how can we satisfy these requirements? And not all of these, again, are technical. So for instance, when I want users, I, and I know I'm not gonna really be good at the whole media wrangling thing, I wanna watch this thing around Valentine's Day because I think that's when I'll be able to get the most attention. So that is a big programmatic requirement. And if I didn't sort of have that, the project as a whole may not have been successful. So from that, we get a sense of trade studies, all the different ways to solve this. And again, there's a bunch of them just, just to show, but I'm gonna focus on one specific problem, which is I think one of the, the fundamental problem of this consumer product uh, in a big data product, which is I need data coming in so I can run the algorithm. But people aren't gonna come in unless they can get the product of the algorithm. So it's a chicken and the egg problem. And I have to think of all the different ways of solving it not just sort of the very high level, but then the way to implement the solution. So, and it's worth mentioning, so JPL is a very big organization. This is just a few people. Uh, you'll see these three people in a lot of these slides, the systems engineer, the scientist, the management, which I wear all of those hats. So I was having a very complicated conversation with myself. 
uh, but at the very sort of, you know, the pre-phase A level, how am I even going to get this data from users? What am I going to have to show? And the management's going to be thinking of, well, these are the programmatic requirements. I am defending these in the design of all the other requirements. The scientist is saying, well, this is the data that I need, and I'm going to make sure that I get it. And then the systems engineer, their job is to sort of reconcile it to, rationalize what makes a proper solution to this. And from this, I, you know, I got sort of the general idea of how everything will flow. We have uh, uh, this Nanaya block. So I'm going to have one launch here, one which is bl block one. And that's just personality testing, because people like personality testing. It's not the algorithm, but it gives me what I need for the algorithm to run. So the very basic level, uh, demographic data and personality data. Block two is sort of a limited release of the algorithm. So it's not predicting whether or not two people should stay together, because I want to do a lot of testing on that before it's released uh, for like very like, you know, moral, ethical reasons. Um, but it gives some people an idea of like when you'll find love, the best groups to find love in, how you can change your social interactions to maximize those odds. So like still interesting data. Uh, and this gives me a lot of the better information that really lets me validate the full algorithm for block three. And just so you know, uh, block one was launched uh, January uh, 15, and block two was launched right for Valentine's Day this year. So then we go into phase A of block one. Uh, so again, the personality testing. And we have, now we have the UI, UX engineer, front end, management pro project, quote unquote, scientists in the systems. Now, again, we have the three people from before, and they're trying to make sure that all those requirements that they have at the very high level are being met, while the people, the, the front end dev and the UI UX and the sort of the technical side, they're finding ways of really fulfilling those requirements and coming up with newer, lower level requirements. And I, whenever the systems engineer and the managers ever meet with anyone else uh, on the technical side, it really is supposed to be an exercise in humility. And this is fundamental for the perspective of team trust of, look, I know this is what I want, but I'm probably pretty stupid. So tell me how I'm wrong, and I'm sure there's still a better way. And so when that's reported up, say, to the systems engineer, then they have to meet with all the other technical leads to make sure, OK, this is what so-and-so told me. Does that make sense? And then the systems engineer tries to rationalize between what everyone's been saying. OK, now we enter into phase B. We come up with those lower level requirements. So how are we going to build this? So the front end dev and the UI UX, they're still going on to the next step of actually putting together like uh, wireframes, uh, just sort of like templates and code, uh, maybe Django models. Uh, and then the systems engineers making sure is they're sort of like starting to like put these things together in their minds or like as mock-ups, as prototypes, that like these are fulfilling the technical requirements that they themselves came up with. And the project manager's looking at the calendar and the budget, making sure like, okay, progress is fine. And you end up getting, and this is what we had for Nanaya, and I, and I don't know who else really does, well, does this, but I've talked to a few uh, dev friends and other uh, people I, I, who are doing some of the external work for me, and they hadn't seen like this level of requirements with like systems test plans and component test plans, validation plans, whatnot, for what was a very small project. Uh, but this is what we were able to produce out of all of this. And this was like in my meetings with various different people trying to make sure what made sense. And then we reviewed it all of us together before ever continuing. And then we actually got to building. And now everyone comes together. So front end's really doing this because this is about how we're getting data from users. Uh, and so they're building the website. UI UX is making sure that, OK, what you're building satisfies the requirements that I laid out, because I'm now looking at it and I'm testing it. The back end dev is making sure that all those form fields is getting the data into the database. The scientist is making sure everything that's coming into the database uh, from those forms actually satisfies the science requirements. And then the systems engineer who is really intermediating between everything is just tearing their hair out. Uh, normally, there's plenty of systems engineers. And then the manager is, again, looking at the calendar and the budget. So OK, we launch block one. We have our phase E. Yay, it's a success. Uh, we have enough users that we can put together the next step, which is the partial algorithm. But now we need to get a lot more data from people because we're using the algorithm rather than doing personality testing. And so we have uh, the front end and the UI UX. They have to do a completely different front page, uh, or the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, just um, page in general. And that's, we knew that from before. But so how will this be changing from what we have? The scientist is going over making sure that all the new data coming in is exactly what we need for the algorithm. 
Backend dev is making sure that, okay, do we have to change any of the uh, models or database structure? And they're, again, all meeting over this about the users putting in data and making sure that they are happy to put in data, and then ultimately the result, the report that they see, is worth the time emotionally that the user has put into it so they can be happy even if the results are really sad. And so that's kind of how things worked uh, for that one specific problem. And you know, and when we got to that block to phase A and we reviewed and we're like, okay, there's a bunch of things that need to change. But we actually already knew that from the beginning. And the things that ended up changing really weren't severe in scope and they had minimal programmatic impact. So I would say the whole Nanaya experiment of applying this sort of waterfall-ish approach, and I don't think it really is because of how much there is that sort of roving systems engineers was a bit of, as I think, a success given how limited the resources were. Uh, we launched uh, block one again two years ago, uh, block two this year, and then uh, we had over 200,000 users since Valentine's Day, and I'm the one doing the marketing, and I'm doing my PhD, and I'm still supporting some JPL stuff, so boy, you know, I, I, I'm very satisfied with how things worked. And whatever we do in the future, our code base is ready to go because we have planned for everything down the line for other products, products as well. Um, so of course there's failure, and that's I think the most important thing out of everything. Uh, so the point is that we planned our failures. So we said, okay, we're not gonna close on our budget. Uh, we know we're not, but maybe we'll be good. Maybe we'll have some things ahead of schedule, but we didn't get to everything. And the things that were not on the critical path and we saw we're not gonna get to, and we had specific milestones planned, we said, okay, drop this, don't think about it. And some of the devs were actually kind of upset, and I was kind of upset about some, but it's about the mission success, bottom line. Um, and then operational success, I woke up the second day after launch to find out that a lot of people in Brazil were using this, accessing like uh, who knows how many database connections that we just hadn't planned for because we didn't think anyone was really gonna use it. We said if this ever happened, we should just party and forget about it. So we knew about it, we thought about it, and just said, meh, whatever. And well, what happened was we sort of predicted and we fixed it. But again, it's an operational failure that we sort of planned around and the plan was to not care, so. <laughs> so okay, people might, I, I, I don't know, I, I've talked to a few people about this, which is why I was giving this talk where people are very skeptical about how I went about the development. And there's criticism, so like, how can you really plan for things in advance, and especially for others who aren't doing necessarily consumer product and you have specific business customers, I understand that you know customers' minds change. Um, so of course, this what I did isn't for everyone. It's about what can we learn from it and apply it elsewhere. What are the sort of like rules of thumb? And really, in my mind, is that again, there's no silver bullet. I don't think. The concept of the self-forming organic teams is necessarily a good idea. I don't think what I did was necessarily a good idea. It is highly contextual based on your team's experience. So that's the social dynamics, uh, the various constraints that you have, criticality. So there, I don't think there's any real single optimal framework, but maybe there's a framework of frameworks. And when I was thinking about this, uh, and I did a little bit of research to say, okay, well, am I totally crazy? There's actually some folks that wrote about it in a, a book, uh, Balancing Agility and Discipline, A Guide to, Perple to the Perplexed, uh, by Bohem and Turner, and I read through some of it, and it was, I thought, a pretty good read of this. So we can think of just three high-level parameters, so risk, criticality, and complexity. Whenever you have a lot more of them, you need to have that hierarchy and planning to make sure that you satisfy that project or mission goal. And on the other hand, if you don't have these, having teams that sort of figure out for themselves on a technical level what makes sense ends up maybe working out better on meeting that mission goal optimally. So what the hell is the point of this hierarchy anyway then? Because uh, I don't necessarily think it's risk, criticality, or complexity. I, I personally believe it's about the flow of information. Uh, I don't know if anyone recognized Foucault at the bottom, who may disagree with this argument, but this, I would say this applies to projects and development which is if you're going to have hierarchy and people that have like management authority, so that includes technical lead systems engineers or you know, the very highest level managers, it's about having a consistent flow of information that is universal across the team so that everyone knows how to speak. And it is the role of authority and power to mandate and fix the concept of language. 
So, oh gosh, this is a lot of words. And this is for posterity, and you can read it now, but like, you know, it, the, you know I would say rule one of like, if you're gonna have a project, there's no one correct answer. And you really, I think, have to feel that and believe that in your hearts. Uh, the second rule is, is I think it is up to the people who come up with the idea and who see it out forward, so it would be for the management, but leadership in general, so that's technical leads as well and systems engineers. Um, to come up with the high level goals and requirements and then work with the technical leads to see how the uh, lower level requirements work out. And then as the project continues, the leadership, so again, the technical leads, uh, not just like you know, um, you know, the code monkey devs, bad term, sorry. Um, uh, the systems engineers, the management, to really make sense of progress and to either change the requirements while working with all the uh, folks below them in the hierarchy or to uh, adjust the flow of uh, resources. And you know, that's about it. Uh, please do use and share Nanaya. Um, right now, I'm sort of thinking of a block two and a half. Um, there's a few other funny things I'll be doing as soon as I finish my PhD. Uh, I, I do like a little bit of theory. So I, I think I can apply quantum field theory to uh, you know, romance and human relationships. We'll see about that one. Uh, and then uh, I want to be able to do some lovely sociology studies with the data we have coming in. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for coming. So I will say that is a function of your, oh yes, thank you. Uh, so the, the question was, um, you know, one of the most important things to a successful organization is the ability to uh, pivot when things uh, may not be working as expected. And is it possible that when you're planning so much in advance that you still retain the ability to pivot? And again, I think the uh, two parts of that question, one, it's a function of your team. So if you have at the very high level people who have that foresight of the potential issues you can run into. And again, this, the whole point of pivoting at an organizational level is the programmatic risk. It's not the technical risk. So can you plan out, and when, when, you do, when you are planning out, can you broaden your scope, so in your brainstorming sessions or whatever, in that pre-phase A, when you think of all the things that can go wrong, it's not just about, again, on the technical side, it's like, okay, we have this product launch, and maybe this isn't getting the revenue we expect from it, like what are the other things we can do? Um, now, if you have a, you know, this organic team, it can more effectively technically adapt to the challenges uh, that are faced. But I would say if you're really thinking deeply and you have the sharp minds at the very beginning, you can think ahead about the ways to pivot, and I can say that I've done that on our own, and it was precisely because of that level of planning, I have software interfaces in the existing structure that let me pivot without uh, minimizing the expenses for making additional software. So I feel that I'm very confident in my team's ability but every team will be different. Are you also saying, if you're clever enough, you can just think of everything in advance? Yes. And, and, that, and that, I understand that's a bit, pretty big jump, but you know, it depends on the team of folks that you have. And at a place like JPL, I feel very privileged to work with the people that I work with. I like that you shared the basic uh, takeaway of thinking about all the normal, uh, non, uh, sorry, the things that could go wrong. Yes, um, let me see if I can go back to that slide to just jog my memory. Um, so one big thing that actually has to do with the data acquisition strategy is the first one, which is the psychometric test evaluation. I need to get personality tests from people uh, as a part of the algorithm so I can do matchmaking. If anyone's done online dating, there tends to be some portion of that. Now, a part of the user experience is making sure people feel satisfied. All, a lot of personality tests is click a question, click a question, click a question. But the part of my product is there's gonna be a lot more questions that aren't personality. I don't wanna bore the hell out of my users. So I spent a lot of time mitigating the risk 
of people not wanting to use it because they got bored of answering questions. And that's, again, an interdisciplinary problem where I'm bringing UI, UX. But in the psychometric test evaluation, I evaluated as many options as I found to ultimately pick what I picked. Not, so I was testing for not just the science side of am I getting consistent results over mul taking multiple times? Does it fit with the algorithm needs? But also like getting all my friends to use these various test examples. Did you like it? So you sort of do that preliminary tests to figure out before you're building anything else, does this sat, do you think this satisfies the requirements? And of course, if it still failed. But you mitigate that risk when sort of the risk you came up in brainstorming before you get to printing things. And that's sort of the phase B type stuff. Sort of the critical technologies mature. Um, I don't know if that satisfies your question, but maybe I can try to give some other ones later. What do you mean the transition? So I like your point about the value of having hierarchy to make sure that language was being used consistently and that there was a steady flow of useful information. Mm -hmm. Does that necessarily align with decision making or how was decision making done at, uh, at your company with that sort of structure? So I would say, I think that it is the role of those that have the broadest view of the information, providing that it is good information, those are the ones who will be making decisions. Now, the decision lies with what I would call, if you go to the JPL hierarchy, you know, it's going to be these folks here that are making decisions about everything below them on the technical aspect. These guys are making the language decisions and some of the programmatic decisions for these two different teams so that they can interface together with respect to the plan that those guys decided on before these guys even came into the picture. Um, so I think it's a function of, you know, authority lies best with those that know best what they are doing. So, boy, that's kind of a mouthful. Uh, but I, I think ultimately, if, if you have a team of people and, you know, if I know, and this goes back to maybe the other point I made here, where the role of management when they have these meetings is to be humble. Look, I'm not the expert. I will probably be making a decision about this but my decision is worthless and possibly very dangerous if it is not well informed. So I know from the programmatic or the system side what makes sense, the global picture. But I cannot decide that in a good way unless I am fully technically informed and I respect the true, like the technical requirements that I personally didn't draft. And again, every team will be different. And from my experiences at JPL, teams work very, very well in management and systems that engineers have a great deal of technical experience, kind of like, in a sense, the military. A lot of generals or people who've become officers may have been on commission from the beginning. They spent a lot of time knowing what it's like to be a soldier. So you know what it's like as boots on the ground in, in business um, in other businesses, perhaps. That may not necessarily be the case. So it does depend on the organization. Oh, OK, sorry. Thank you so much, guys.